Welcome to the epic, the sardonic, the titillating, best fit square! Hey folks, welcome back to Best Fit Square Show. I'm your host, Manuel Ortega. Today, we take a look at sailing the Atlantic trade winds. To help us better understand this is our very own in-house scholar, P.T. Hey, P.T. Hey, Mo. What's up with sailing the trade winds of the Atlantic in the early 1700s? Yeah, a few things, Mo. Let's take a closer look at one trifecta. Sugar, Cuba, and España. The sugar production of Jamaica, an English colony, had been satisfactory. It dwarfed the sugar production of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Santo Domingo. However, Spain was growing, and so were its needs. Cuba was poised to meet those needs. Hey, I thought Spain was in the business of conquest for gold. Cortes, you'll remember, in 1504 quipped, Spaniards want gold, not to till the soil like peasants. <laughs> Indeed, but Spain needs to make Cuba productive. So having come up short on gold, Spain sets its sight on cultivation. Guess that leads us to sugar, right? You guessed it, Mo. From the time the Moors were pushed out of Spain, sugar production languished. With prosperity and population on the rise, Spain needed to up its production to meet demand. Gold, not much of a sweetener for pastries, huh, P.T.? You got that right, Mo. What was needed was more than advice from abroad or psychological encouragement from the king. What was needed was more labor. Yeah, but weren't there slaves already in Cuba? There were about 100 plantations on the island. But little had changed during the past century. The plantation mills were ill-equipped and undermanned. What? Not enough oxen or slaves? There were few rivers robust enough to power their poultry water mills, obliging plantations to rely on oxen and slaves. And now I suppose you're going to say, these mills were hell holes. Wow. In that description, though, there was little to no mechanization. Slaves cut sugarcane with machete, carried their cuttings to the mills where other slaves processed the cane. Okay, just curious. How do slaves, without mechanization, turn sugarcane into sugar? There were copper kettles laying over open fire pits. Each kettle attended to by one slave. A far cry from the terrestrial paradise represented in so much European literature. These mills were tombs suffused in sulfur smoke. Slaves were naked at the waist, their bodies lit by the fire of the ovens. Their cries, their woeful songs, the orders of the overseer, Echa la candela o puerta! Heard above the din of cane being crushed, boiling liquid splashing, and the cutlass ever ready to cut off the hands of slaves when caught in the rollers. Whoa, that is unpleasant. Was there any relief? Harvest was the hardest time, but the gayest time. The slaves had more cane to suck, aguardiente to drink, and fiestas to celebrate. What is aguardiente? Cane brandy. So basically what you're saying is the slaves drank themselves into a stupor. Given what we know today about addiction, do you think generations of self-medication, you know, alcohol abuse, could be a root contributor to today's propensity toward addiction in certain populations? Whoa, that's strange off topic, Mo. Great question, though. Is there anything else you can share with us about living conditions, such as they were, for slaves working these mills? Well, there was the home of the owner, small houses for salaried workers, a kitchen, a nursery, and a hospital for the slaves. There would also be a carpenter's shop, a blacksmith's forge, a cooper's shed, stables, and perhaps a distillery to produce aguadiente. And of course, the lodging for the slaves, usually a group of some primitive shelters. Wow, seemed like plantation owners kept their costs as low as possible. What were costs for a plantation? To found a plantation, one had to have access to a slave market and money to buy and sell slaves and maintain capital investments. A third to half the cost of founding a sugar plantation was the cost of slaves. In Cuba, as in the other West Indian islands, slaves were the most valuable part of a planter's investment, more so than land, machinery, and buildings. A third to half the cost of founding a sugar plantation was the cost of slaves? Male slaves were the most prized because they believed female slaves could not work as well on plantations. Second, because they thought replacing male slaves was cheaper than raising slave children. Pregnant slaves, after all, were useless, and they consumed food. As a result, there was probably only a third as many female slaves as there were male slaves in Korea. Peace for the ladies! Just saying!